Okay, so the first speaker is Jata uh, Nigam and we'll talk about uh, uh, tour message passing with the equivariant and centered uh, representation. So please. Thank you, uh, and good morning to everyone. Uh, so I realized that I promised in my abstract to talk to you about Hamiltonian learning, but I thought I would take this opportunity to talk to you about something that I've been finding recently more cooler. And um, since Yulia will anyway talk after me about Hamiltonians, I don't think you'll miss out on much. Um, so instead today, I'd like to tell you a story, which I think links a bit with the uh, panel discussion we just had. Uh, and I'd like to present you a story about identifying ingredients in uh, machine learning, that when you have uh, pinpointed which step of your machine learning is giving you what, you can take them, you can arrange them in whatever order and lead, like extend your framework to more complicated targets. Okay. Okay. So um, just as a quick recap, because you've probably seen this a bunch of times already, uh, so a supervised machine learning framework goes as follows. You are building models for a particular property of interest, could be interatomic potentials or any energy that you might be interested in studying. Uh, you begin with some structures um, that you have sampled from the relevant part of phase space you want to study. And most people, myself included, spend a lot of time in constructing representation functions, which are intermediate inputs to your model. And then you provide this to a model. So here, for example, um, okay. Uh, here, for example, we have a linear model. So the model instead, uh, in turn, will learn weights, which when combined with your representation function will lead to the best of its ability, the closest reconstruction of some reference calculations. And then you use this framework for prediction. So at the same time, there exists an alternative set of schemes that combine this representation and modeling into one whole step, and this forms the end-to-end -end learning approaches. And we'll see today if they are really disconnected or not. Uh, so wait until then. So before I tell you about why so many people spend so much time in constructing these intermediate functions, let's quickly recap what, how one goes about constructing them. So you start with your structure, and at each atomic position, you assign a Gaussian function or some localized function. So like in yesterday from A's talk, you've seen localized functions, which are delta functions. Here we work with Gaussian functions. And then around each of the atomic position, you consider a localized environment. And in this local environment, you tag each of the neighbors one by one uh, by its relative position. And since you have this pairwise representation of each of your neighbor with respect to a central atom, uh, I would call this a pair density. And then you sum over all the pair densities in your neighborhood and construct what would be a neighbor density, uh, which is a function of your central atom. And uh, clearly you've seen this in many, many forms. So here, since we're talking about Gaussians and its atomic positions, this is a function in position space, but it could be in any space that you can imagine. Uh, so the procedure that I have told you very, very quickly in words incorporates a series of mathematical steps, uh, and these uh, encode your representation function with some symmetries at hand. So in this way of identifying relative positions, you have encoded translational symmetry, and in considering the sum, you have uh, inc incorporated permutation symmetry uh, of your uh, system. And these are further rotationally symmetrized, and you've seen from also the talks before me that whenever we start talking about rotational symmetries, you see a lot of these LM indices or spherical harmonics. And it's not a surprise because spherical harmonics provide the most natural language to talk about rotational symmetries. And so you see all these coefficients with LM indices. And then you take these density, you can symmetrize over one single copy of your density or what uh, multiple copies, what would be considered a tensor product. Uh, and we'll see why this is helpful. 
But in general, this forms a framework that is uh, generally, generally applicable to any system. So this would be an ACDC uh, framework or atom-centered density correlation framework. So just for all the rock fans in the audience, I have uh, a reference to this ACDC band. <laughs> And so what is the advantage of doing this complicated procedure that seems quite involved? So the advantage being that you maybe start with these three, uh, three molecules here, three water molecules, which are just rotated copies of each other. And if you're trying to learn the energy, which should be the same for each of these structures because they are just rotated copies in vacuum, um, this should in fact uh, map to the same representation function because this incorporates all the symmetries that uh, these water molecules have. And so uh, instead the model now does not have to learn that the uh, inputs that you're presenting to it are in, in fact equivalent, but instead it can spend time in learning things which are truly distinct. And of course this neat architecture can be extended to targets which are more complicated like dipole moments or tensorial properties. So from yesterday's talk also, uh, I think, um, it was mentioned that a dipole moment, which, which is a Cartesian vector, has a direct mapping to a spherical harmonic. Uh, and so if you want to learn something like this, you start again with your structures. And here, of course, the properties are going to be different because they are rotated copies. And so the dipole moments also rotates with the structure. Um, so you start with the same procedure. You construct the atom-centered densities for each of these structures, which would be the same. And then you, have this additional function here, which uh, is a spherical harmonic. And averaging over this leads to a representation which now rotates the same way as your target property. So what happens now is that in the spirit of what is called the wigner accurate theorem, you've uh, separated your learning of your equivalent target into something that captures the symmetry. So which here is your uh, representation and then something that is independent of the symmetry, so invariant weights. So now with the same set of weights, you've captured uh, the rotation of your dipole moments. Um, so I like to think of this as adding, you know, like spices to your some recipe that you're making. So incorporating different kinds of symmetries is like maybe adding some sort of pepper to your recipe. Some people like pepper because maybe uh, you're worried about symmetries. And then also depends on how much pepper you add to your system because it depends on how much symmetry you want to encode. And so this framework is um, more and more and more and more employed because it uh, provides a complete linear basis to expand your target property, which is something also that you have seen yesterday. So uh, I would like to maybe present here uh, an analogy. So um, I will talk to you about a central character, which I'm calling today Bob. And we can think of Bob as a person whose energy or his mood during the day uh, changes based on his interactions within his friend circle, okay? So we can think of uh, Bob's interaction with Jim uh, or interaction with Sally or interaction with Alice. And these together, when you sum them up, uh, control his mood to some extent, okay? And so these are like these pairwise interactions or uh, one neighbor that's controlling the energy of Bob. So this would be captured by a one neighbor correlation. So like the pairwise uh, displacement, if you want to think in terms of atoms. And so you get this naturally by averaging over rotations, one single copy of your density. And then in the same way, you can consider uh, energy contributions from two neighbors. So for example, here we have Bob again, and maybe Bob gets along well individually with Jim and Sally, but when the three of them are together, they fight a lot and so Bob's energy decreases. So you need to capture this uh, effect as well. And uh, this you would capture by, um, okay, uh, averaging over rotations, two copies of your density, because this naturally gives you um, your uh, environment in terms of two, uh, two distances and, and an angle. And then you can do this on and on for, um, for more and more uh, higher order contributions to your energy. So you can think of triplets and so on. So one of the things that is nice here, uh, not only by name, but uh, also I think it's a very neat framework. So um, for a long time, it was thought that when you want to construct higher order representations that, that capture these higher order contributions to energy, you need to start by averaging over these, uh, you know, uh, 
atom densities from, from scratch, but it turns out that you can use the information that you have at the previous order. And so for example, here in, in terms of this analogy, you can think of um, this contribution of triplets of atoms as, uh, as, the, as recycling information about Bob's interactions with Sally and Alice at the, at the second order, and then con uh, considering an additional contribution from the third neighbor. And this scheme uh, leads to uh, linear scaling of your descriptors. And uh, as I said before, when I talked about spices, since I come from the land that is infamous for its spicy food, I like to think of these as ingredients that uh, when you combine in the correct order and uh, in, in appropriate proportions, you get any recipe you want. So having said that, uh, this is a figure from this uh, paper that was already one year ago. And this seems a bit overwhelming, but it shows here all the representation functions that have appeared over the past decade. And uh, all of these basically start from the same Cartesian coordinates, but uh, they reflect similar information about your structure in just in terms of different languages. So one of the key things here is that this tree unifies all these languages in one tree. And uh, at the same time, there exists, again, this alternative end-to-end um, -end, um, models. And we'll come back to this shortly. So the key ingredients here to the success of all these representations are symmetry, which we've talked about extensively, uh, completeness, which means that the represent, this intermediate representation function that you're constructing maps distinct structures to distinct functions, otherwise you've lost the advantage of constructing this intermediate function in the first place. And then the advantage of locality. And so uh, one of the problems that one might be interested in studying further is, uh, what if the property that we're trying to learn is not just atom-centered, because till now we were learning property as atom-centered composition, uh, but what if it's n-centered? So for, um, for uh, the last few years, there has been interest in the community to um, target more fundamental quantum mechanical outputs, such as the single effective particle Hamiltonian matrices, which are uh, indexed by two centers or orbitals on two different centers. Um, so one would need to have representations that treat two centers on, on an equal footing. So we start again with this atom-centered framework that we have so far, and we can combine this with the uh, pair density that I talked about a couple of slides ago, where we explicitly uh, tag one other center. And we can combine these two using tensor products again, which you have to symmetrize, and get what is an atom-pair correlation. So if we go back to our analogy of Bob, uh, and we consider here his environment described by one neighbor, um, which is Alice. Uh, now I tag the special atom Sally. So now Bob and Sally form a special couple. So you would like to define how the energy of this couple changes with respect to the couple's environment, right? So one way to do this is to uh, define this couple environment, which is the interaction between Bob and Sally. And then you can choose to describe the relation of this couple with Bob's environment, so Bob's friends. But at the, uh, so this would be the, um, joint representation. But at the same time, you could have chosen Sally to, uh, Sally's friends to define the interaction, right? So there's some sort of asymmetry in how you're defining this two-center correlation, which comes in handy. Um, so for example, here, if we have a water molecule, um, which is expressed in, uh, the Hamiltonian is expressed in some atom-centered uh, orbital basis, we can uh, have, three different blocks of this Hamiltonian. So we can have orbitals that are centered on the same atom, uh, which would correspond to like maybe um, just learn, learn something using the atom-centered density. We could have orbitals on two different atoms, which are different colors here. So you can think of uh, Bob and Sally again. So here the red thing is Bob and the blue thing is Sally. And you can think of the interactions and orbitals on them. Uh, but here again, so the atoms being distinct means you can explicitly know which uh, center is Bob and which center is Sally. But now comes the complicated case where both the atoms are of the same species. So for example, now we have Bob 1 and Bob 2. So you don't know beforehand which uh, atom is Bob. And so this gives this um, asymmetry in tagging the centers comes in handy because now 
you can construct symmetrized and anti-symmetrized combinations of, of your two center correlation. And this is what would be called mathematically permutation equivariance. And so um, this way, you've built in rotational symmetry, translational symmetry, and permutation symmetry into your representation. So what this does is that since uh, all the molecular groups that you know of are subgroups of the rotation and permutation group, this automatically encodes the, um, the um, rules of molecular orbital theory. So for example, here, I trained a model with one uh, random uh, Hamiltonian matrix of a benzene molecule, just random data. And so the prediction is of course also random because it's learning useless uh, stuff. But what happens is because of this representation, your output uh, is now, um, in it, it's, um, it captures automatically the degeneracies of the eigenvalues. And um, it also captures furthermore the distortion effect. So if you distort your structure, it captures the degeneracy breaking of your eigenvalues, which is the yarn teller effect. And this you get for free. You don't need to do anything else. Um, so now I would like to switch gears and uh, go back to uh, how this framework now naturally extends to message passing, because in the framework that I've described to you so far, we have a way of uh, um, describing a central atom, we have a way of uh, describing a pair of atoms. And of course, uh, this, if you look at the language that is used in message passing, generally it's um, this uh, here could be cons considered as a message between two nodes and the edge between them. And then you can extend this to multiple um, other nodes in your neighborhood. And then you can sum over them. And this would be a message, fun message from all your um, neighbors. And now you can use this message to update the representation of your central node. And this is usually called the update function. Um, so again, uh, going back to our analogy of Bob, Jim, and Sally, we, uh, so, so far I showed you how we can construct higher order correlations by just considering Jim, considering Jim and Sally, and Jim, Sally, and Alice, and basically sums of them. And now we can look in for the message passing case again, start with the one neighbor correlation. So we have, for example, here just shown for representation Alice, but again, remember that you sum over all these uh, pairwise neighbors. And then you, you tag a special other center, which is now Sally, which is again, we are going back to our case of representing a couple. And now this is our two center correlation. And now we can think of Jim, who is Sally's neighbor, but not directly related to Bob, okay? So uh, if there was no message passing, Bob would have no information about Jim. But now since Bob knows about Sally and Sally knows about Jim and Sally being a gossip monger can bring information about Jim to Bob. And so here you have constructed um, a single neighbor correlation on Sally and single neighbor correlation on Bob and combine the effect of the two. So there might be a case where Jim is a simultaneous neighbor to both Sally and Bob. And uh, how, what, so what does message passing bring us in this case? It brings us uh, more information about um, Jim. So because Jim is a distant neighbor to Bob, you don't trust the information you get from Jim directly so much. But since you have this intermediate relay point of information, you maybe trust the information you get through Sally about Jim more. So, um, okay. Uh, here, if we look at, uh, look at the case of this degenerate methane uh, data set from, uh, from this paper before. Um, so uh, a three neighbor correlation, which basically looks at a central carbon atom and the three neighbors around it, which is centered only on the carbon atom, does not capture to the full effect the interaction between these two hydrogens. And that's why the learning curve saturate quite early. But if you center yourself on all the atoms in your system, you bring in information about all sorts of correlations, you get a lower error. Now we consider the message passing case where you center yourself again on the carbon atom, but now you have information about the neighbor's neighbor. So you get information about the interaction between uh, H3 and H4 through the message that H3 passes to your carbon. So with just this carbon centered um, message passing representation, you basically recovered the performance of your all center three neighbor correlation function. 
And uh, another way to look at uh, how much more informative uh, this message passing scheme is, is to look at how the feature reconstruction error happens. But I think I will not go into the um, details of that uh, since we're running out of time. Uh, so I will just conclude with this, uh, with the three set of trees um, that I've talked to you about today. So we started with this tree of representations and on top of these three, we built different models. So the models could be linear, kernel, neural networks, so on. And for a long time, neural networks seemed to be disconnected, but they were doing almost similar things in different language. And you can basically relate this tree of neural networks, which also diverges into feature-based, message-passing-based, and other forms of neural network schemes, but related back to the tree of your representations through this message passing uh, atom centered correlation functions. And of course, I mean, since the neural networks have their own uh, spices like nonlinearities or attention schemes, you can borrow them and include them in your atom centered correlation scheme and choose how to uh, can combine all these ingredients to get whatever recipe that you desire. So with that, I'd like to thank you and yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the, <laughs> for the nice talk. And uh, uh, we have time for one question or so two questions. Thanks, Julia. So, um, so just to help my understanding, the so the you symmetrized over two sensors, right? So you've got you you've got like two SO three sensors, mm -hmm. and you symmetrize over the permutation, mm -hmm. right? So that's that's different than say um, you know a message passing between the two or an environment that's centered in the middle, because that would be permutationally invariant yeah. to that system. But yours is equivariant, so mm -hmm. it can really tell you. Oh, this thing's going on in terms of the occupation and matrix on this guy, and this is going on on the other mm -hmm. guy. Right. Okay. And I understand. Very, okay. very nice. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So I'm sorry if I didn't leave you with time to ask questions, but okay, I'll be, of course, available throughout the end of the workshop. So uh, let's uh, talk outside. Okay. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you again. And uh, uh, yes. Thank you.